Welcome to the Newsbeat Podcast, where we examine critical issues of social justice. Each episode features interviews with prominent writers, educators, thought leaders, and activists, and is infused with original music and verses from independent artists. The Newsbeat Podcast, the New York Times Podcast Club Pick of the Week in January 2018, and featured podcast on Best of the Left. Here's your host, Manny Faces. Hey, everyone. This is Manny Faces, producer and host of Newsbeat, winner of the 2018 New York Press Club Journalism Awards Best Podcast Prize. We mix social justice journalism with independent hip hop to illuminate issues that quite simply demand more attention. Welcome to another episode. As always, we're brought to you by Maury Creative Studios, an inbound marketing, sales enablement, and client retention, and Platinum HubSpot partner agency. Learn all the extraordinary things they can do for your business at maurycreative.com. Okay, so free speech, the right to assemble, to speak out, and publicly oppose the actions of your government. It's guaranteed in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Yet what we're seeing more and more in Ferguson, Missouri, at Standing Rock in North and South Dakota, hell, in the streets of Washington, D.C. and Manhattan and all across the country, are coordinated, militarized, and legislative crackdowns by that same elected government against peaceful public dissent. Let's spell out some of the points of contention that lead people to communally demonstrate, many of which we've covered in previous episodes. Racism, inequality, institutionalized oppression, war, police brutality, the right to clean air and clean drinking water. You would think that speaking out against atrocities, yes, these are atrocities, would be welcomed, even championed, by a government literally founded upon public dissent. You would think that communities that are peacefully demonstrating against concepts as fundamental as the right not to be shot or choked to death by the police if you're unarmed, or peacefully demonstrating against the contamination of public water supplies, would be, at the bare minimum, respected and tolerated. But no. Instead, federal and local government and various law enforcement agencies respond to these and other similar public outcries with tear gas and mace, attack dogs and water cannons, sonic weaponry and mass surveillance, mercenaries and violence. And this war isn't merely being fought in the streets, it's got two fronts, the other waged within local legislative chambers. Since the indigenous-led protests at Standing Rock in 2016, there have been more than 60 anti-protest bills proposed by state legislatures across the country, including everything from protections for motorists who injure or kill a protester on public roads to bolstering quote-unquote trespass violations. Besides a long list of other controversial tactics that read more akin to anti-terror and counterinsurgency efforts deployed across the United States' ever-growing battlefields throughout the globe is what's known as kettling essentially penning and then arresting law-abiding demonstrators en masse on riot charges. Don't let the powers that be remember what happened the last time a government tried to repress the people's right to protest in this country. La Revolución, anyone? <laughs> in the thick of all this and sharing their stories from the front lines in this war against what are supposed to be our inalienable rights, is Erin Wise, the youth voice amplifier for ceding sovereignty. I think what's most at stake right now with the government treating environmental stewards and protectors and defenders the way that they are is that we're standing to lose our humanity. Alice Sperry, a reporter at The Intercept. I, I think the stand in rock is certainly comparable to police deployment that we've seen in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in other places in recent years uh, as the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for police accountability have taken to the streets. And Vera Eidelman, the William J. Brennan Fellow with the American Civil Liberties Union's Speech, Privacy and Technology Project. One of the big trends that we've seen with this anti-protest legislation generally is that it seems to be reacting to the most successful, most powerful tactics that are used by protesters. Our extraordinary musical guest for this episode is also our new 20 2018 artist in residence, hip hop fusion artist and educator, Liquid. Um, here we go. This is criminalizing protest, the US government's militarized and legislative crackdown on people's right to dissent. Consider it Newsbeat's sonic protest. Martin County Sheriff's Department. Hi, um, I need to report um, an assault. Okay, where did it occur at? Um, it's happening right now. Okay. Um, it's, what town? It's on the um, sacred, uh, it's up at uh, Standing Rock, 
they're innocent, unarmed people being attacked with water in uh, freezing cold temperatures. Um, unarmed people. It's happening right now. There are militia-style police firing at point-blank range with high-powered mace um, on unarmed people. Who protects the, the people? I arrived in August of 2016. I had inadvertently sent my little brother and sister up there trying to get them to do something post-college and um, they pretty much uh, showed up, made a bunch of friends and when I got there they were like, hey, Lisa, this is our big sister, she's going to take care of us and all of a sudden I had like 30 youth to care for. In that time after the International Indigenous Youth Council was formed, we experienced our first act of violence directly from the uh, mercenaries that worked for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And they unleashed dogs on our women um, and men and had um, dogs biting and making our people bleed. Are you telling the dogs to bite the protesters? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, the dog has blood in its nose and its mouth. It's just still standing here threatening. You can't put your blood on the dog. You're gonna get your own. You can't put your blood on the dog. That's just gonna get your own. You will let them that was in September 2016 and October. Um, we had our first use of Brent militarized police force when they came to raid one of our prayer camps. They actually brought in tanks and um, these MRAPs, various, I guess, different weaponries, um, like these loud sound um, equipment monitors that emit this really awful, awful noise that kind of make you want to drop to your knees and you lose all your equilibrium. I have to use uh, headphones or earphones because they have a, a sound gun that they turn on ever inter intermittently and it freaking hurts. They also brought in water tanks that they didn't end up using until November. At another point, they escalated from um, the mace that they had been using to tear gas, and the tear gas to the concussion grenades that they shot into the crowds at people. Um, they were shooting military grade bean bags at us, um, rubber bullets. We also had several instances of uses of water cannons. Actually, the water, they were pumping the water that we were trying to protect into these water cannons to shoot them at us in negative 25 degree weather in the middle of November. I, it, it seemed like what started with, you know, attacks on us from these mercenaries that had been hired by the pipeline companies then escalated to the involvement of the local and state governments, um, the state-sanctioned violence, which then moved into inviting police and law enforcement from five neighboring states that then came in support with the National Guard to stand against a bunch of natives in moccasins fighting to protect water. There were a lot of people, water protectors, activists, allies, who gathered near the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota to challenge a pipeline that was being built by the government there through the water of the tribe and creating a lot of other environmental problems. The state and local police reacted quite seriously by surveying and by trying to shut down the protests. The FAA also enacted what are called no-fly zones to limit the ability of drones and other media to document what was happening, especially around some of the biggest police activity um, that was happening on the ground. The protests were successful in stopping the permit for a bit, but then ultimately the construction continued. And not only the protesters were arrested and affected, but also individuals who were there to document the protests, including reporters like Amy Goodman and also indigenous reporters. There is an arrest warrant out for journalist Amy Goodman because she had the audacity to be a journalist. She was reporting on the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Native Americans that have been protesting it, reporting on dogs being geared toward uh, some of the protesters in a violent fashion. She got arrested for trespassing. 
One of the big trends that we've seen with this anti-protest legislation generally is that it seems to be reacting to the most successful, most powerful tactics that are used by protesters. So a lot of the bills that we've seen respond to the anti-pipeline protests near Standing Rock and other related protests, also racial justice protests in Missouri that shut down highways to protest the police killing of Mike Brown. So it really is rather than reacting with substantive change to the things that the protesters are speaking out about. It looks like state legislators are reacting to the tactics and trying to make that attempt to make their voice louder actually quieter, making it harder for them to speak out and talk about the things that they find troubling in society. I see you, do you see me when we see us, they just can't see Power to the people, not to cut you up, but human beings ain't illegal. My body is the cage and my spirit needs freedom. We all need freedom. The First Amendment afforded, we sought it when you bought us. That nobody own us, so oh, it's like Britain when you fought them. It's oppression. You dress in fascism, it's classism. Economic cataclysm, that's true capitalism. One thing I know for certain, if it's hurting, then they working. They dig beneath the surface, cause we found our true purpose. Uh, and we all know it's worth it, but sovereign is protected in our presence. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. On the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, outrage and anger. Protesters of different ages and races demanding answers in the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown at the hands of a policeman. I was in Ferguson just three, four days after Michael Brown was killed in 2014. And I saw something very similar to then what happened in Sandy Rock later play out in Ferguson, which is, you know, like a suburb. My first day in Ferguson, I saw police, just tear gas, people in, in the streets in the middle of the afternoon at Sarah McDonald's. There were like families with children. It was an absolutely peaceful demonstration. And, and, you know, you've all seen Ferguson and you've kind of seen videos of what happened in the next days. Things only escalated. Uh, we were getting, we were closer to the quick trip where a group of protesters have been trying to assemble. Police was pushing them off the street and telling them um, they will be subject to arrest. I think for a lot of people, you know, in, in my generation, that's probably a pivotal moment. Uh, that's just because we have short historical memory. I mean, political policing in this country goes a long way back, and, and the tactics and technology that have been deployed have always been warlike in, in a sense. The FBI's director confirmed it to Congress this week. We've done it in Baltimore, we did it in Ferguson, as I recall. Using sophisticated surveillance aircraft if a city requests help. Through a Freedom of Information request, the ACLU obtained documents detailing the FBI's surveillance during the riots and protests, 10 flights, and 36 hours of surveillance over Baltimore. I, I think Standing Rock is certainly comparable to police deployment that we've seen in Ferguson, in Baltimore, in other places in recent years, uh, as the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for police accountability have taken to the streets in the last few years. But I think it's also important to remember what's unique about Standing Rock. I mean, this was really a dispute over a pipeline that was also a dispute over land and whose land this was, and, and particularly the land around the Standing Rock protest grounds where the pipeline crossed. That's disputed land. That's land that, according to treaties between the U.S. government and Indian nations, belong to the Indian nations and that the U.S. government just sort of annexed over the years. And so from the perspective of a lot of the indigenous activists that were at Standing Rock, this was not really their police coming and tear gassing or, or hosing them with freezing water in winter or using all kinds of other technology on them. It, it was a foreign military force intervening on sovereign land, their land. Just a little bit of context. A little bit over a year ago, The Intercept got a tip from a contractor working for Tiger Swan, which is a mercenary security firm. And this firm had been doing a lot of contract work overseas, mostly in Afghanistan and Iraq. But at this point, they were working in the US for Energy Transfer Partners, which is the oil company behind the Dakota Access Pipeline. They had hired them, you know, supposedly to, to do security work for the pipeline, but what the documents that this tip and that up revealing showed is that actually the kind of work they engaged in was much more sweeping and broad. It was really a massive surveillance project that Tiger Swan undertook on behalf of Energy Transfer Partners. For months, they surveilled 
infiltrated um, activist communities, both at Standing Rock and then later in, in their neighboring states. And they, they started following progressive groups all across the country. And, uh, and the documents we obtained um, include detailed descriptions of, of all of this surveillance work. They name hundreds of people that were involved in pipeline protests. And in some cases, you know, they reveal that the private security firm were following them around, chasing them with their cars, definitely doing a lot of surveillance on social media, as well as doing radio eavesdropping and, and using all kinds of technologies to listen in on, on these movements as, and again, infiltrating them as well. And then in addition to this, what the documents also showed is that this company didn't really limit itself to surveillance, but they also engaged in essentially a propaganda effort by which they were creating their own news reports and sharing them on social media and you know, trying to put a spin on the narrative around the protests. So it was really quite extraordinary. It was far beyond what we think of security companies as doing in, in these kinds of situations. It's really quite fascinating and it does show the background that this firm had in the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some of the memos that we obtained. At some point, these memos describe the water protective movement, which is a, a peaceful movement, as an ideologically driven insurgency with a strong religious component. And they even compare the anti-pipeline protesters to jihadist fighters. They have this absurd quote that I like to, to read to people because it just kind of shows the insanity of it all, where they basically say that the water protector movement generally followed the jihadist insurgency model while active. And so we can expect the individuals who fought for and supported it to follow a post-insurgency model after its collapse. It's a full-on terrorist attack. Mass surveillance keep the rioters intact. But that's a lie, and we know the full facts. U.S. patrol on the troll as you scroll my facial recognition tally up the toll my. We in the streets, you can wear that blindfold my. From Standing Rock to Ferguson, we on our own my. My head up, we in an open air prison. Tear gas, freezing water, it's beyond chilling. No more division, no well wishing. In dark days, we the prison. You want this oil, we the chrism. Uh, you want this soil, you a pilgrim You did this to our ancestors, not our children The urgency is beyond this urgency Who you call when 911 is the enemy emergency North Dakota lawmakers are proposing new legislation that could make life tough for any future protesters there. That legislation includes an exemption if motorists accidentally injure or kill a protester by running over them on the road. It comes after months of rallies against the Dakota Access Pipeline and confrontations with police. As far as any protest bills that have been introduced in North Dakota, I mean, they're not they're not just there. Here um, in Minnesota, the state that I'm currently in, they're introducing um, anti-protest bills as well because people here are gearing up to fight Line 3. Um, we have anti-protest bills in Virginia because they're fighting, I think, the transatlantic pipeline out there. We have anti-protest bills going up in Canada because they're fighting Kinder Morgan. You should leave! You should leave! Because those seats you sit in will be replaced by somebody who will grab it. Shut it down! The angry crowd erupted after the House Civil Law Committee approved a bill which would allow protesters to be sued to recover costs for what the bill calls illegal demonstrations. Most of what we've seen has been state legislation, and that is actually where most of this change can happen. So that's really the level to watch because most laws that have to do with protest, they come in the form of criminalizing or adding penalties to things like trespass and obstruction of traffic. And those are things that are criminalized generally at the state level. We see that even in the specific terms of the legislation where they really try to mischaracterize this peaceful protest as economic sabotage or economic terrorism, completely misconstruing what these folks are doing and using language, which is obviously incredibly powerful, to change the way that protesters are seen in people's minds and how protesters may even be willing to perceive themselves in terms of, you know, worry about associate themselves with something that they don't believe themselves to be associated with. So North Dakota was the state that saw by far the most of these bills actually pass into law. Other bills that were proposed included these quote unquote hit and kill bills that basically said that a driver who was exercising his quote unquote right to drive would not be held liable if he accidentally hit a protester who, you know, happened to be pushed off of the sidewalk into the street at a mass protest. 
Other versions did focus on what legislators deem quote unquote critical infrastructure sabotage or their attempt to protect critical infrastructure that really, in other words, is targeting anti-pipeline protests that focus on trespass specifically of quote unquote critical infrastructure, which isn't necessarily even a term that's been defined before in some places or where it has been, there's already a law prohibiting this. I think what's most at stake right now with the government treating environmental stewards and protectors and defenders the way that they are is that we're standing to lose our humanity. We don't even recognize that that life in its most basic and intrinsic form, even in the soil, even in the marrow of the earth, the riverbeds, you know, the waterways, we, we don't even value that enough anymore. How is it that we're going to march for our lives and save our children or, you know, stop a war with Russia or whatever it is, you know, that we're, we're up against due to Trump's insanity? How, how is it that we're even going to save ourselves if we don't even have humanity enough to allow people that are trying to protect the very earth that we walk upon? We stand to lose resources, of course, you know, we stand to lose um, more, more women, right, to the effects of sexual violence that occur with pipeline and extractive communities. And we, we stand to lose more children due to the lack of resources invested in their communities to suicide. And we, we stand to see, even in non-native communities, we stand to see more marginalized communities, likely communities of color, be impacted at various points of extraction from the extraction of the fuel itself to the plastic that is made, to the lack of water that is in the community, fresh water for the community like in Flint, Michigan, but the incinerators that are there in Detroit are pumping out you know, this awful air that's impacting surrounding communities. So not only does Flint not have water, they can't breathe. And I mean, we, we stand to see so much more from losing our humanity and valuing the earth so little that we don't even value life itself and don't even see a necessity to protect people in any way. I, I think we stand to lose that. And we, we also, we're gonna lose our home. We don't really have a say in what the earth is going to do. And as, as proven through time, the earth will shake off whatever's on top of it and reboot. And I 100% I wouldn't blame the planet for, you know, thanking us for diligently fucking her up and then um, making her exit. I think that it would be her right and, you know, those of the ancestors that came before us to say, what the hell, you know, we did all we did so that you could be there and this is how you repay us. Nothing left for the future, only enough for yourselves. Yeah. These raps will battle the M raps. We won't bow, we frick when you frack. Friction for your diction on extractivism. Activism is a right, we don't need permission. But 20 states want America great. Since Trump is head of state, martial law awaits. Both Dakotas, Tennessee, and Oklahoma seal their fates. Don't wait, get to the polls before it's too late. You impose a right to drive. I have a right to be alive. Can't trespass on land where my ancestors died. It's mine. Who? It's mine. It's mine. Who streets are streets? You and I, we seek. Hungry for the truth, so we'll eat the elite. Thirsty for the proof, so we flood in the streets. We on the beat, they on the beat. Who lasts? We'll see. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. Once again, this is Manny Faces, Newsbeat's producer and host. I want to just take a few minutes here to recap what we'd consider some of the key points, takeaways, or what we sometimes call the upshot of this episode. Bringing some added attention to some of the voices you just heard and their respective groups, uh, maybe mention several associated causes, and share some ideas on how you can become more involved in helping to rectify some of these deeply troubling issues. You see, for us here at Newsbeat, it's not just enough to create these episodes, what we sometimes lovingly refer to as revolutionary ear candy, the soundtrack to the rebellion, or just simply some really dope-ish. We want those stories to resonate long after your earphones are unplugged. Such stories deserve, they demand action. We want them to have an impact, spark change, help make things better. Or even as Tupac Shakur once explained, I'm not saying I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the brain that will change the world. And folks, that begins with you. 
As I mentioned in this episode's introduction, one of the missions of Newsbeat is to meld the realms of independent journalism and independent music, hip-hop specifically, to illuminate some of the most pressing social justice issues of our day, the topics we feel demand more attention than allotted by the mainstream media or your elected officials. In this episode, we hope you'll walk away with a clearer understanding of just what's at stake here. The First Amendment states, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. As Aaron Wise, Alice Sperry, Vera Eidelman, and all those audio clips you just heard so vividly chronicle, this very fundamental right, this inalienable right that is absolutely, again, guaranteed to each and every American by the U.S. Constitution is quite literally under attack right now. They're out there dousing protesters with water cannons in sub-freezing temperatures. They're firing rubber bullets at demonstrators, macing them, spraying tear gas. They're infiltrating peaceful groups, spying on you with drones, hiring mercenaries to harass you, arresting y'all, and charging you with rioting. This is your government and your local law enforcement at work? What the hell happened to serve and protect? And those lawmakers, more than 60 anti-protest bills from state legislatures across the country since Standing Rock, including protections for motorists who injure or kill a protester on public roads or, or bolstering quote-unquote trespass violations? What happens when your government criminalizes protests, makes public dissent illegal through excessive force and literally changing the laws of this great land to prosecute and severely punish those that dare to question, dare to demonstrate, dare to speak out? then by definition, this government would no longer be a democracy. It's no longer a quote-unquote free society. We at Newsbeat firmly believe what the Founding Fathers did when they crafted the Constitution so many years ago, that the government answers to the people, not the other way around. We ain't having it, and neither should you. The upshot here for me is that you can do something about this. We encourage you to learn more about the topics and issues presented in this episode. Contact these groups and these sources mentioned. Volunteer. Lend support. Reach out to your local, state, and federal representatives. They work for you. Call them up. Write them a letter. Send them an email. Go to their offices and crash outside their doors. Demand that they oppose any such militarized and or legislative attempts at restricting or criminalizing your right to assembly and to speak out. You tell them Newsbeat sent you. Aaron Wise, as I mentioned earlier, is the youth voice amplifier at a group called Seeding Sovereignty. She's been involved with Honor the Earth, and the International Indigenous Youth Council. Seeding Sovereignty is a self-professed, multi-generational youth-led model by and for indigenous and non-indigenous women based on mentoring relationships and principles of unity, solidarity, justice, sharing, and respect. They can be contacted at seedingsovereignty.org. Honor the Earth's mission is to, quote, create awareness and support for native environmental issues and to develop needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable native communities. They use the arts and music and the media and, quote, indigenous wisdom to ask people to recognize our joint dependency on the earth and be a voice for those not heard. Honor the Earth can be contacted at honorearth.org. The International Indigenous Youth Council was started during the Standing Rock Indigenous Uprising of 2016. Its mission is to, quote, organize youth through education, spiritual practices, and civic engagement to create positive change in our communities. Through ceremony and action, the group is committed to, quote, building a sustainable future for the next seven generations. The International Indigenous Youth Council can be contacted at indigenousyouth.org. Alice Sperry reports on justice, immigration, and civil rights for The Intercept, one of our crew's favorite news outlets. Its founders, award-winning journalists Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, and Jeremy Scahill, pride themselves on fearless adversarial journalism. So do we, and so we recommend you check them out immediately and frequently. We love them. TheIntercept.com is their home. Alice can be reached at aliche.sperry at TheIntercept.com. As I mentioned in the introduction, Vera Eidelman is the William J. Brennan Fellow with the American Civil Liberties Union's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Her writings on many of the challenges currently facing protests in the United States can be found on the ACLU's website at aclu.org. And once again, those amazing rhymes you heard throughout the episode were conjured by South Carolina slash New York slash worldwide hip hop fusion artist Liquid, who we're proud to announce has officially signed on as our 2018 Artist in Residence following in the footsteps of equally phenomenal rhymesmith, Silent Night. 
Check out more of her truly inspiring music at I Am Liquid, L I K W U I D dot com. Check out Silent Night's work at Silent Night, like a chess piece, dot bandcamp dot com. Additionally, I want to remind y'all that if you feel so inspired, if you found this episode moving, informative, and if you like what you heard, if you want to hear more and help contribute to the creation of these special sonic hybrid of journalism and independent music, you can support us too. Contribute at usnewsbeat.com slash support. And know that all your generous donations will go towards supporting the independent artists appearing on our podcast. We'll also give you a special shout out on an upcoming episode of Backbeat, our in-house discussion between each episode, where the Newsbeat crew discuss the making of each episode and further highlight some of the respective issues tackled. Maybe you'll even get a much sought after, although ever elusive, official Newsbeat tote. What? Yes, tote. That's for Rashad. He loves totes. More on that and other Newsbeat related merch at usnewsbeat.com slash shop. Now, lastly, before I bid you adieu, I'd like to resurrect the first tidbit I mentioned in this episode's introduction. It's something we're all sincerely very humbled by and really, really proud about. Our season one finale was titled Why We Riot, Institutionalized Inequality, Racism, and Oppression. We dropped it last December. It was recently recognized as the best podcast in the 2018 New York Press Club Journalism Awards competition. That episode, and I suggest you all go back and check it out if you haven't already, and if you have, well, go listen to it again, that's fine. It features passionate insights from renowned intellectual and Harvard University professor Dr. Cornell West, activist and former Green Party vice presidential candidate Rosa Clemente, University of Baltimore professor Elizabeth Nix, and lifelong activist and chairman of the Newark-based People's Organization for Progress, Lawrence Larry Hamm. Punctuating all this is an original musical score by Silent Night and genre-bending jazz, hip-hop, soul, rock, fusion outfit, the band called Fuse, which he fronts. Now a little bit more about this award because a little humble brag is necessary. We're super honored. The nonprofit New York Press Club itself is a fantastic organization with its stated mission of, quote, protecting the rights of all reporters while providing networking opportunities for journalists and communication specialists to discuss professional issues and affect change. Its annual awards contest and installation dinner, longstanding traditions in New York media, recognizes journalistic excellence in print, broadcast, and online by news outlets and publications in New York City and across the United States. Winners in the annual contest were selected across 29 categories, from nearly 500 entries submitted by TV, radio, newspapers, websites, magazines, and newswires from New York and all around the country. To give you a bit of perspective and an idea as to whom some of these other outlets are, others earning high praises in other categories included the New York Times, New York Daily News, The Wall Street Journal, Fortune, The Daily Beast, The New Yorker, Reuters, Associated Press, Bloomberg News, and The Intercept, among many others. So giant big ups to all those extraordinary journalists and outlets that were honored. Big ups to our crew at Newsbeat and its sister company, Maury Creative Studios. That's MauryCreative.com. And a very, very, very special big ups to Dr. Cornell West, Rosa Clemente, Elizabeth Nix, Larry Ham, Silent Night, the incomparable band called Fuse for their amazing contributions to really shine some much needed light on those issues and raise some much needed awareness. Again, to try and spark some change. As always, thanks for listening. We're Newsbeat, social justice journalism and original hip hop mixed up in an attempt to make this realm even more of a better place. I'm Manny Faces. Listen to previous and future episodes of Newsbeat and subscribe for free at Newsbeat.com. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, The Podcast Addict, wherever you get your favorite podcasts, we're there. Check out the New York Press Club and a full list of those exceptional award winners at nypressclub.org, the band Cold Fuse at bandcoldfuse.com. And most importantly, as we like to remind listeners from time to time, get out there and go do something about this stuff. Peace, everyone. Till next time. One love. The Newsbeat Podcast is owned by Newsbeat, Inc. Visit us at usnewsbeat.com. The producer and host of Newsbeat is Manny Faces. Our editor-in-chief is Christopher Taworski. Newsbeat's managing editor is Rashed Meehan. The executive producer of Newsbeat is Jed Morey. Our podcast and website are co-produced and managed by Morey Creative Studios. Newsbeat relies on listener support and grants. Artists that appear on the podcast are compensated for original material. 
To support Newsbeat or contribute to our Artist in Residence program, visit us at usnewsbeat.com and click on support. Subscribe to Newsbeat by Mori Creative Studios wherever you download your podcasts by searching for Newsbeat.